Welcome again, saints. Of course, I am your dearest servant and lesson host. My brother, Pastor Brian Dale from the St. Mark in Waterloo, Iowa. And today, our lesson scripture, the devotional reading is Ezekiel 36, 25 through 30. The background scripture is Romans 2, 1 through 29. And the print passage, Romans 2, 12 through 24 and 28 and 29. And that does not matter whether you are looking in this the Standard International, or certainly the Sunday School Publishing Board, those scriptures are the same. So what we are going to deal with, let me get the key verse. He is a Jew, which is one uh, inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart and the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. And all, I want to read Romans 2, 12 through 16 uh, really quickly as well. And it says this, all who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law. All who sin under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. Indeed, the Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things require the law that they are lost themselves, even though they do not have the law. They should... They show that the requirements of the law are written on the hearts. Their conscience also bear witness and their thoughts sometimes accusing them and other times even defending them. Verse 16 says this, uh, this will take place on the day when God judges people seekers through Jesus Christ as the gospel declares. And, and some big ideas before we go forward here say we're going to critically evaluate the assumptions of right and wrong. And I'm going to spend some time there just giving you some big ideas from these lessons instead of charging out line by line because I want this time to be effective. I want you to get your portion and, and certainly move on with your day praising God for whatever it is you learn here. And we have to critically evaluate uh, saints our assumptions about what is right and what is wrong. And as you all know, my mission in life is to deal with the people of God in the church of God and certainly uh, the leaders in the church. God sent me to watch the sheep watchers, that is to point pastors back to him, not to supervise them. I'm not their authority. I don't, it's not that toward relationships, but I will in person to the face and here point them back to him. Somebody has to watch the sheep watchers because right and wrong are often evaluated based on what people did that came before us. We know that theologically, and that's what I want to deal with theologically, just to press this point home, uh, regardless of where the lesson goes with this, because I am sure somebody else will be able to go down and deal with it that way. But I am here to get you to the 70,000 with to the mind of God. Those are big ideas. And certainly when we talk about right and wrong, there are some things that we did in the past that we simply did not know any better because those who came before us, they did the absolute best they could. And that's why those of you Sunday school uh, students who've been with me for the last several years, you understand I get righteously indignant when these educated sociopaths today, these educated black preachers come along criticizing those who came before us with their smart tales. Those people who raised us were smart enough to get us to the house of God and we stand on their shoulders, but all of a sudden we get a little edumacation and we want to look down our nose at those people who came before us, those sharecropping, uneducated preachers. I'm not saying that was always the case, but most of the time it was the case. Some of them couldn't even read, had to have People read the scripture to them, but the word of God, but the spirit of God moved on them from an interpretive and a preaching standpoint. So, but we learned some things that, that, that weren't quite accurate. And one of those things that we were told that wasn't in the scripture that we played along with, especially uh, during the December holiday time, so-called Christmas, was, for instance, the three wise men visited baby Jesus in the manger. We've all, when I was growing up, we did the play. Uh, Baby Jesus in the Manger, The Preacher's Wife, famous movie, Witness, Whitney Houston, uh, Denzel Washington, and Courtney Vance was as the preacher. Uh, they did that play. They were getting ready for the play, and at the end of that movie, they did the play. It came out, I think, around 1996, 1997. Great movie. I still love that movie. Yeah, a little indoctrinal, but but a feel-good movie nonetheless. But they, this thing about three wise men visiting baby Jesus in the manger, playing out in churches all over the world, it never happened. The Bible first never says that there were three wise men. The Bible said wise men. The second is those wise men never visited baby Jesus in the manger with three gifts. There were three gifts, but they. the Bible says the wise men visited the child in the house. That's different than visiting a baby in the manger. 
We've been told that, and that turns out like not to be true. So there are some things that we said were right, and critically evaluating our assumptions theologically of right and wrong, and this is going to go in a different direction, but this is where I'm going with it. We want to examine everything that we are told, and I know on these videos, I often, uh, saints of God, seem contrary. That's not necessarily what I am attempting to do, although I reevaluated some things, and over the years, I was told, for instance, by my pastor over some years that women shouldn't preach. He told me that. Now, before I go forward, before you get your wigs twisted up and your nose is all scrunched up and you get the stank face, pastoring is another conversation. Even then, our sisters are called to be prophets. And even John the Baptist had disciples for a season. So those of you who say, sisters ain't supposed to lead at all. And this is what Paul was saying when he said, shut your mouth in the church. Women read three chapters over. Because Paul said, if you're going to prophesy, sisters, this is how you do it. Cover your head, etc. Shut your mouth. I'm trying to keep our sisters down. And I say that because I used to be that guy too. So even that was not right. And the hypocrisy of it is that we were teaching that women preaching in the church was wrong. The hypocrisy of it was when it came down to raising money, they could get up there and plead. They can go all over the place and plead for money. They can invite people to the church, tell people about Jesus, run even the missionary committee. Think about that. Our sisters were on missionary committees for a hundred years in the church, but they couldn't speak in it, but they weren't allowed to preach in the church, but they could go outside the house and preach, but couldn't say nothing in the house. <laughs> Help me with that. Help me with that. Let me make it a bit more plain. Women came to the bridegroom. They came to the founder of the church and spoke in the presence of the founder of the church. One woman, the woman at the well went out, preached Jesus and led people back to him. And the founder of the church, Jesus didn't. What did he do? He rebuked the woman, shut up. That's not what he said. That is not what Paul was teaching. So I'm saying that's another example. I could go on with that, but you understand what I'm saying. We got to reevaluate what we believe necessarily is right and wrong because what is right may not be even what's righteous. Here's what I mean by that. You could quote scriptures and point a finger at somebody for their sin and you may be right. But if it's not done in the spirit of righteousness, God is not pleased with it. And there were many people in the Bible that were wrong and they spoke to Jesus and Jesus kept held his peace, didn't say nothing or ask him a question. Didn't even respond to him. So an untimely word, although it may be what's right, is it righteous and was it moral? Was it, was it the truth in love? Did you speak that right thing in love? Love is what makes it righteous. And second, internalize God's law so that it's written on your heart. And we know that we couldn't possibly keep the law. The law came for the knowledge of sin. Jesus, as a fulfillment of the law, came to offer us a way to wipe that sin out, not to abolish the law. Jesus said, think not that I've come to destroy the law, nor the prophets, nah, but to fulfill them. And he did that. He fulfilled them. He finished what they began. Finally, before we move forward, prayerfully examine your conscience before making life choices. Now, I don't like that word conscience necessarily because even people without the Holy Spirit have a conscience. I mean, they just, because we know, man, there's people that done murdered people, ain't got saved, and then been crying about it, and then wouldn't kill themselves or did something crazy because their conscience was eating up. Don't mean they had the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to read 17 as well. Verse 17, Romans 2, 17, behold, you are called a Jew and retest in the law and make us your boast in God. And you like, you know, his will. And he approves the things that are more excellent, being instructed of law and are comforted that you yourself are a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness and instructed the foolish, a teacher of babes, which is a form of knowledge of the truth of the law. Thou therefore, which teaches another, why don't you teach yourself? You who preaches a man should not steal. Do you steal? What is saying here, saints uh, today is why are you being a hypocrite, putting yourself up as this moral person, as this leader in the kingdom of God? And Paul wasn't necessarily talking about like preachers stand up in the pulpit preaching, don't steal and atheists. He was talking about believers necessarily in general, because this the application is much more broad. 
Are you telling people to do something that something is wrong that you yourself do? Those are the things that we should not speak on the things that we haven't yet been delivered from. And we know that because Jesus said in Romans chapter seven, when it began with judge not that you also may be judged. Jesus was saying a few verses later, first remove the beam from your own nine. You see clearly enough to remove from your brothers. The apostle Paul uh, in Romans chapter two, this chapter right off the top of my spirit began with this. O thou man of God. Do you judge us another and do the same thing? How you escape? How should you escape the damnation of God? So it's saying you must be positioned to judge in order to be pleasing to God and to make the righteous judgment. Even Jesus told someone you've judged rightly in the matter. And God had a complaint against mankind from one of the prophets said, nobody calls for my judgment or my justice. God wants us prophets, especially you to call for his judgment. But we have to do it from a place of integrity. We don't call on God's judgment for things that we struggle with. I'll give you just a personal example with me. I will preach against jealousy, worldly jealousy, fear of losing something, you know, jealousy over like some woman or even your wife or husband's wife. Well, I'll preach against that all day long because I don't struggle with that. I never have. Even when I was you coming up, I was a boy. Um, there, there was this bass. I played basketball against this guy in high school named Mike Davis. He went on to be Mr. Basketball. I mean, he was the best player. You know, there's 2,000 ball players in the state. Mike was the best. I mean, they call him Mr. Basketball, which is a designation. 1990, the best ball player in the state went down and won a state championship. And people was like saying, you need to do this, man. You need to do this to Mike, man. He doing this to you. He doing that to you. They even made a rap about Mike trying to get me hot at Mike. I, but I liked Mike. Mike D was a good dude. We got between the lines, man. Mike gonna drop 30 on you, 30 and 10. <laughs> he going in three blocks, four, five blocks. But he was an assassin on the court, but he was a good dude. I, I was never jealous of Mike. I didn't even like playing basketball. I'm six, five. I never liked playing basketball. I did it because I was pressured to do it. But people, that's what they do. People want you to be jealous. So I never struggle. I'm not jealous. But now I make my boast in God because I know what he's going to do through me and not necessarily me. But I don't struggle with jealousy. So I preach against jealousy like or preach being nice to people because I'm getting in your face, man. So, again, do we preach that someone shouldn't, for instance, be jealous and we're jealous? He should still, we still that people should have faith and we don't have faith. You're not going to escape the damnation of God if you do that. So when you break that, when you break those things, you dishonor yourself. Understand that. And people know, man, I will not let some minister at this church that don't tie you. They ain't getting behind the mic praying over the offering. They ain't getting up to preach, to tell you the truth. And it's not that they trying to buy a spot. It's just that they I'm not going to let them get up there and preach something that they don't believe. Giving is just as much a part of worship as preaching. Some people have the, a heart forgiving and will I mean just uh, exceeding the abundantly they don't give it all away so do we preach things and do things that people that we don't even believe what changes need to occur in local Christian education ministries to focus on producing more Christ-like believers I'm preaching against the idolatry of Christian education Christian education by itself is fine we need to define what that is is being Christ is learning through the word of God in the direction of the Holy Spirit to be more Christ-like. That's all Christian education is. It ain't degrees. It's not attending every Bible study. There are uneducated Christians who remain uneducated in the word, not by a degree, and come to Bible study every week. That's just how it is. So it's not any of those things, even that the Sunday school publishing board for you Sunday school publishing board people, it's not even what they're pushing. Now, I had a conversation with the top leaders. I was on a conference call with the, the rising leaders of this, uh, the, the Sunday school lesson. And then I was on a call with those jokers and they were trying to push like Christian education that, that like it was something like that. And it's not because here's the thing. There are people that God calls that may never enter the doors of a college and may never pick up something and teach this particular book anyway. But they got the spirit of God. They study the word. They disciple people. And moreover, they love on people. I know shepherds that are real shepherds, real believers, even in the city that don't have the gift of knowledge of the word. They just don't. They ain't going to call a lot of scriptures. But I know God called them because they're leading God's people. Their grace is enormous. Their lifestyle is there. And they will preach their hearts out telling people about the love of Christ. And they ain't got a bit more piece of paper than a little bit. So as I close here today, 
saints inwardly and outwardly, according to the lesson of the, the standard international, we want to reflect what we say. And when we respect to the Sunday School Publishing Board, of course, it is a matter of the heart, right? It is a matter of the heart to uh, say something and believe something and then follow it out. We'll see you next week.